اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا ابي القاسم محمد واله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين واصحابه المنتجبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمه الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <coughs> we stated that islam was introduced as a minimalistic religion and the prophet of islam knowing full well the nature of human beings and the human condition knew that the human beings will evolve they cannot be restrained by so many rules and regulations they have to be given principles otherwise where is the charm of the revolutionary process where is their creativity the prophet of islam understood well and these are the things that we shall continue henceforth the need of people to interpret to have a free hand in reaching out to their god to organize themselves in a society to change and to rechange it is only minimalism that can actually accommodate a global community today if the muslims say to me that islam is the best of religions what they mean is this organized faith of islam they are not talking about the islam that the quran talks about so i ask them in your organized faith you have no scope for equal citizenship and right for christians and jews the people of the book will be praying jizya to you and as far as the people who do not belong to abrahamic faiths are concerned they are statelessless in your world how can your islam at all be a global truth and global reality this is what i ask them the answer is that the formalistic islam the organized faith of islam that we have today with such fine tuned rules and regulations with its norms with its rights and wrongs can never be a global religion a global religion has to be minimalistic based on principles which allows for human expression human beings can explore themselves what is right what is wrong they can develop they can cut out they can add on they can benefit from each other's knowledge base and this is exactly what has been happening throughout human history and we will see this in the next few days but at for the moment only from ibrahim to nabi musa we saw a huge change within the human community it became more sophisticated it became an international world now when moses comes with his code that code is still upholding the minimal principles that ibrahim came with and in addition it adds to it in order to accommodate the newer needs of its own community after the last prophet are you telling me that the human community has not evolved if it has evolved then by priority its needs have to be catered for and its needs have to be catered for in accordance with the human condition of growth and evolution and seeking of social harmony coexistence reciprocal benefit from one another this cannot be accommodated in the exa in the islam that we have at present because that islam is restrictive that islam is shut its doors were shut at the time of the prophet in the way that me and you understand it so now answer me this question should there be slavery in islam or shouldn't there your intuition will say there shouldn't be but your quran will not be able to prove it for you because we are not reading the quran accurately i was in tokyo and we were talking about the rights of minorities in muslim majority states and this is what i observed and then of course i spoke about it that all of us who are gathered there with our ayatullahs and our muftis and our intellectuals the muslims and the christians alike what we saw there was that we intuitively understood that what is happening within muslim lands is wrong 
not giving rights to minorities, equal rights to minorities in the name of citizenship, because our religions don't allow for equal rights, so under the banner of citizenship, let us give them equal rights. Then we faced a huge problem. Well, how do we justify this from the fundamental and the primary text of Islam, the Quran and Hadith? This is the observation that I made to them and I said, look, intuitively me and you know what is right. The inner God speaks to us through our human condition. He says, you are all equal citizens of a country. But in order to convince ourselves, we have to revert to our texts to find justifications. And our texts do not give us justifications because the text will tell you that the non-Muslim is najis. They have to give diya. There cannot be any interaction with them. How will you give them equal rights within the Muslim state? The Prophet did not come with such an Islam. The Prophet, as we will explain in the lectures that are to come, gave minimalistic Islam. He gave principles of righteous existence and he left it upon the Muslim community to evolve with these principles. The Prophet initiated a movement of banning slavery. It was an absolute norm of his community. He took birth within a given context. He couldn't do otherwise. He came inside a language. He had to speak that language. He did not come with a new language. When he came, there was a contract law there. He had to work through those contract laws, tweak it and modify it. That's all he could do, the blessed prophet of Islam. But he initiated these movements in a minimalistic fashion. He, at every point, says, free a slave. If you do this, free a slave. If you do that, free a slave. If you do this, free a slave. It is pleasing to Allah to free a slave, so on and so forth. He left moral instructions. It was the job of the evolving human godly mind to come to a pedestal and to say slavery henceforth is abolished for once and for all. And that is only possible if we understand the meaning of minimalistic Islam. The Muslims today are in a real dilemma as we go into today's topic and recap a little bit from yesterday, are in a real dilemma. On the one hand we say, and these are all assumptions and these are false assumptions and we want to talk about it a little bit in the following lectures, that the Quran is eternal. Now if the Quran is eternal, this is just an assumption, they don't understand the meaning of eternity of the Quran. I will ask you, find another Abu Lahab if the Quran is eternal, yes? Quran is eternal, but not in the way the naive Muslim mind has understood. I will say, go and find me Abu Lahab now, if the Quran is eternal in the way that you understand. Listen carefully, I am saying Quran is eternal, but not in the way the Muslims understand, yes? Not in the literal capacity. In the literal capacity, when Muslims say Quran is eternal, I say to them, find me Abu Lahab once again. If he has gone, then how can you make that verse eternal? The essence of that verse is eternal, not the formulation of that verse. Similarly, if your Quran is eternal in the way you understand, then you will always have to maintain a status of the owner and the slave in order to keep your Quran eternal. And this is the crisis faced by the Muslim mind. The ISIS today will prove their barbaric actions through the verse of the Quran that they have not understood at all. But that is not the problem with the ISIS, it's the problem with the Muslim mind to the core. The Prophet left minimalistic Islam with us and he said you are going to evolve. This Islam is a global reality. It can accommodate the global human with its variety. There is no finality to whatever is being taught the human glory should prevail, evolve, see what is the best model of existence. This is how the blessed prophet empowered the human community and the human mind. Previously, they were shackled by their rituals and their ceremonies, their practices, their cultures. The prophet saw that these people, because they are within a system, they can't understand the ills of the system. So he as an outsider had a fresh perspective. Through his fresh perspective, they could see their ills and they broke the shackles. How strange, after he leaves us, we fall back into the same trap. Isn't that amazing? Two people could not tolerate each other in the time of the Prophet. He made them tolerant and appreciative of each other. Today the Muslims in the name of Islam can't tolerate each other. 
Isn't it the same thing that is happening? The Prophet came to a community who had practices upon practices upon practices. He broke them all. He said, none of these are of any value. The Quran says, they sell bir and tawallu wujuhukum shakra mashriq wal maghrib. There is no goodness in facing east or west. There is no good in any of that. There is no good in entering your house from the back door. There is no value to these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all these rituals of yours, if they are not essence bearing, they have no meaning. I'm giving you a minimalistic law and conduct. You now evolve in light of these principles that I'm giving you. There is no sacredness but to you. This is the reason these Arab minds that were so closed and so boxed were liberated and they began to flow and they began to evolve. Do you know the verse of the Quran? I'm just explaining these things as we go along. It says, Kulu washrabu hatta yatabayyana. Eat and drink until you see the white light of the morning. Yes? You know the Sahabas were so casual. One with good eyesight would eat and say, oh, that's the white light. The other one says, I don't see it. And he go, carries on eating for another 10 minutes. But Arif looks at the last second to take the last puff of his cigarette. And then he says, I can't open now, but at this second now I can open. We have reduced God altogether. The Prophet's Islam had humanness about it. It is only human to have this looseness. The human looseness was a part and parcel of Prophet's Islam. It was minimalistic. It was based more on morality, not on the physical law itself. So we come to this, that the Prophet's Islam was minimalistic. It is alien to communism, capitalism, feudalism, monarchy. All of these are valid for the time that they attain the goal of human evolution and human goodness. And as soon as they begin to curtail it and restrict it, the Prophet says, break them and evolve into something else. And I often wonder about the community that calls itself Shia. These are the most laziest minds I have ever come across. They are saying that an Imam will come who will put everything right. So they are not duty bound as human beings to do anything in this world. But if the Imam comes with a very glorious social system, the community that is so ill-educated, would it ever be able to accept it in the first place? Tell me, can Musa come before the Israelites have become ready for Musa? Can Isa come before the Jews are ready for a newer message? Can Rasulullah come before humanity has arrived at a pedestal of maturity where they can receive him? How will the Imam come? until and unless the community is ripened to receive him. If the community is refusing to evolve, if it is bound by a system that was there 1400 years ago without trying to understand it properly, how will their Imam ever come? How can these dormant minds not awaken? Today the Muslims are scared to go against anything they feel is Islam. They are scared. But this Islam came to liberate them in the first instance. How strange is this? Islam came in the first instance and liberated scared, frightened minds and said, question everything. The Muslims in the name of Islam today have become pagans of the Prophet's time in the name of Islam. So the Prophet came with minimalistic Islam in order to allow for this beautiful growth in which there is nothing sacred apart from godliness and growth. So what the Prophet did was, he saw his community and he worked on principles. He gave them, and if you look at our books and categorize the Ulumul Islamiya and whatever the Prophet has contributed, the Quran and Hadith, you will find it into three categories, theology, morality, and ahkam, or kalam, Akhlaq and Ahkam, and Ahkam is the regulation, regulative system or law, whatever we want to call it. The Ahkam came right at the bottom. The first thing was theology. Theology is a sense of purpose of existence. That prevailed. Look at the Quran. Do you find Ahkam inside the Quran? You find very few Ahkam. Majority of the Quran is talking about theology and morality. In its beautiful stories. In the history that it gives us. When he talks about the God and world relationship, 
God and human relationship, eschatology and what will become to human beings, human community and human individual. It talks about theology primarily, and then morality, and finally a law system. Why did he do this? Because he saw that there is no good in giving them a law system. The Prophet's Islam did not operate on threats and incentives in the way we understand. In today's Western world, the only reason I drive at 70 miles per hour on the motorway and God is my witness is because of that camera. If I'm caught speeding, I'll get three points and then eventually get banned. That is the threat that makes me into a proper driver. Had that threat not been there, nothing could restrain me from driving at hazardous speeds and endangering the lives of others. Is this the level at which my humanity has stooped? The only reason I do any good is because I'll get a heavier wage packet. Not because my employer deserves the best of me. This is not how the Islam of the Prophet was introduced. The Islam of the Prophet was not introduced with that whip of hell. That was for the lowest common denominator of the community. It was for the thug of the community. It was only the thug of the community who needed to be warned of hell. The rest of the people were spurred on to righteousness through a sense of godliness. Today's Islam is all to do with God's punishment and God's reward. Now I often say this and forgive me for repeating. Ibn Sina, may Allah bless his soul. Oh, on that note, can we recite Surah Fatiha for Marhum Muhammad Ali and all of our blessed Marhumin Al-Fatiha? How wonderfully Ibn Sina has said it. That look at the heads of these Muslims. They have made their goal into a means. And they have made the means into a goal. They worship Allah to get into paradise. They worship Allah to be saved from hell. Whereas Allah was a goal. Paradise was an incentive to get to Allah. They have made the goal into a means to get into paradise. They were supposed to go towards God. Paradise was a byproduct. If somebody can have the creator of paradise, why would he want paradise? If Qais can have Layla, why would he want gifts of Layla? This is the way we have become. So the Prophet's Islam was not based on threats and on such petty incentives, giving sweets and toffees to the people. These paradise and hell is like a whip and a toffee. How many times do you see that people come to the Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, I have committed this crime. And the Prophet say, you don't, Prophet would say to them, you don't need to tell me. Keep it between you and your God and your God will forgive you. Go away. How many times the Prophet used to say this? He encouraged people to trust in Allah. So the first thing the Prophet gave was theology. He said, look, you are the most noble of the creatures God has created. Your end purpose is to become God-like. Your whole endeavor should be to turn to God, to be liberated from within and outside. Explore the whole world, your God is with you. And from within yourself, remove all your distractions and grow through God. The Prophet explained it in this way. He said, even if you change the whole world, if you haven't changed from within, you haven't changed anything. After you have gone, the world will still be around. What would you have achieved anyway? He said, more than you, Suleiman could have done, but he failed to do. Can you do what Suleiman could not do? And then after you leave this world, who else will continue after you? Your task is to become godly from within. So the Prophet taught a very different type of theology. He said, look, the one you're taking with you is you yourself. You are not taking anybody else with you. You are the reward in yourself. You are the damnation in yourself. It is all about you, nothing else. So people saw that lofty goal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they embarked through Islam on betterment of their own selves. 
they became refined human beings, both internally and intellectually. Then he introduced a system of morality. They said, look, he said, you, through whatever system I give you, are supposed to become a godly being. As Plato says, the whole purpose of a law system is that the individual becomes moral from within. The law system is for little children so that those children start learning that the real purpose from organizing these bodies is to attain a very refined state of being from within. So he said, this is morality. You are supposed to become righteous. You are supposed to become charitable. You are supposed to become forgiving. That is the whole process of becoming godly. And for that, I give you this law system which is minimalistic, which will assist you to become moral and to become godly. This is the way he taught. And then when he came to the community, he introduced it very gradually, very slowly. Now, before we go there, the halal and haram of the Prophet is to be understood accurately, very, very accurately. If Muhammad Rasulullah says, do not consume pork and swine, it's not because he feels like saying it. It is because there are some existential properties in there that are bad for us and our spiritual growth. The Prophet, if he says, do not consume alcohol, it means that alcohol at a physical and spiritual level is bad for us. It is the great parent informing us, telling us, look, this is bad for you, oh child. Don't smoke a cigarette. You don't know the harm it's doing to you. I know. I have seen it. It is like that. But then the level of sin is something else. One is the physical harm. The other one is the level of sin. Now, I often say this to people, that the sin is not to be seen in the law system, is to be seen at the level of morality and theology. If a Muslim were to consume alcohol, then actually he can be making a statement, Oh God, I really don't care what you say. That is the sin. The sin is lesser in consumption of the physical drink and more in the attitude that you know your God does not like this. Why are you doing it? My mother is displeased by me doing this. Why should I do it? Why should I break her heart? The fact that I can break her heart shows how regressed my heart is. But of course, it does not mean that people who drink are evil people. They might not be doing it with that intention. However, the Prophet awoken them. He awoke them and he said, look, this is bad thing. Leave it. It's offensive because it's harmful for you. And your parent, Allah, is getting hurt by you harming yourself. So don't do it. Allah will forgive you even if you drink alcohol. But what when you get lung cancer? Your parent will forgive you if you smoke cigarettes, smoke. Your mother can't stop loving you. But when you get lung cancer, you're going to suffer. And your mother is going to suffer seeing you suffer. That is the way it is to be understood. So all the halal and haram that the Prophet has given, and if we understand it properly, it is only there to build on that moral being. But in that as well, there is gradation. Because as Imam Zainul Abidin Salamullah says to Allah, he turns to Allah and says, Oh Lord, I have sinned. And I have sinned frequently. Even now, when I seek forgiveness, I know that after this instance, I will revert to my sinning. That is me, O Lord. Forgive me. But O Lord, he says, I have not sinned because I have seen you unworthy of obedience. I have sinned through my human weakness. So he makes this distinction, says, you know, I've done wrong. But by God, I love you truly. It has only been on those, in those moments of human weakness when I've forgotten about you that I've sinned. Had I been aware of you, I would never have sinned. So even if I have sinned, it is not because I wish to belittle you. It's like we go to our mother and we say to mother, Oh mother, I know I've done wrong. I know. But forgive me. My intention was not to hurt you. Imagine, this is how he makes people mindful of God at that level of morality. And the ahkam are right at the bottom. However, the beautiful way in which the Prophet works is something that we can't understand and is something that the human community needs now. 
You see, in the name of Islam, we are doing the greatest damage that anybody can do. We have lost compassion altogether. Our hearts don't bear godliness because you are my family. You are Muslims. I will not go and say this to the Christians. Yes, I will not. I will say to the Sunnis and the Shias because you are my family. The Wahhabi, Barelwi, Diobandi, Ismaili, Isnashri, Bohra, you are my family. This is my household. I will say to us. I hope the Christian priests will say to the Christians. What I'm saying here is that me and you, in the name of Islam, have lost the prophetic light altogether. Really? This Islam was supposed to make us godly. It has made us into judgmental beings. We start pointing fingers at each other. We start judging each other. We have become so arrogant about our Islam that it's becoming wholly demonic. I'll give you an example of the times when my eyes have opened. There was a young man who committed suicide. So the first thing Muslims say, he's committed suicide, don't pray on him. My God, is this what your Islam teaches you? Allah says, Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'ah. Allah says, Inna Allah la yaghfir an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru duna dhalika liman yasha. Allah will not forgive shirk, but will forgive everything else. Allah is saying He will forgive everything and you can't forgive? So the Muslims don't pray on a person who has committed suicide. Whereas that person is in most need of sympathy and prayers. So a person had committed suicide. It became a police case. It took three months before the body was released. Hear me out now. The body was in the hospital. Mortuary and then hospital. The body had decayed. Yes? The nurse was outside, the male nurse. He said to us, he said, I know you will not allow me to come inside. So I will stand here and give you water from outside. If you need any help, call on to me. That nurse is not a Muslim, male nurse. He wasn't a Muslim. When we went to attend to the body, I could not tolerate it. Yes, Allah forgive me. I could not tolerate it. My stomach could not tolerate it. Yes. So I said, look, I need your help. The Muslims with me, they just ran away. I said, look, I need your help. I said, look, I'm used to these things. Yes. So compassionately, I directed him and he helped me and gave ghusl. I said to myself, his religion allows him to so compassionately Look at the body, not judge it, not say it's a Muslim, not say it's decayed, not say anything to me, but so compassionately looking at me and says, Arif, just stand there, I'll do this, don't worry. You direct me and I'll do it. I'm wearing gloves if that's a problem for you. I said, look, is he a real Muslim or am I a real Muslim? The answer is he is a real Muslim. His religion or his atheism allows him to embrace godliness and humanity my religion makes me judgmental first and foremost i had to get over the hurdle can i even wash a person who has committed suicide can i even pray for him and that man was so benevolently praying for that body islam is supposed to free us the role of the ahkam was not to restrict us was to allow us to grow now the prophet of islam so beautifully so gradually brings in his islam me and you have become intolerant today if somebody were to be consuming alcohol we would curse them won't we who did the prophet come to he came to people who were alcoholics and yet he found them good human beings what a difference in perspective people would come to the prophet drunk and they would say ya rasulullah to be honest with you, even if you're saying con consumption of alcohol is prohibited henceforth, we can't stop it. Prophet would smile. He would say, try to stop it. He would not say, how dare you? And take the whip out and whip them. He said, the end goal is that you improve. That is what Allah wants. He wants your humanity to come to its completion. That's what he wants for you. Try your level best. If you can't do it today, by tomorrow, try a little bit better. 
people would come to the Prophet and would say, Ya Rasulullah, we are despicable people. We have sinned. The Prophet would say, No, you are good people. Have faith in Allah. Allah will bring the best out in you. Even if you are evil, Allah is good. Trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way he introduces is, is beautiful. The Prophet said, No individual takes birth as an angel. You take birth as animals. You have animalistic tendencies inside you. They are raging. And therefore the Prophet used to be compassionate. He would never punish people. He would say this is their human animal materialistic dictate. From this animal a human being is about to take birth. Allow this human to take birth properly. And he very gradually brings in his Islam. He did not say stop drinking alcohol. He gradually brings in his laws for stopping alcohol. Gradually brings in his laws for praying Salah. Everything in the Islam of the Prophet was very gradual. Very, very beautiful. It was very realistic. He appreciated human beings' humanity. People would make slip. They would come to him. He would say, the door of Tawbah is still open for you. Maybe at this point we need to cite a little example just to refresh our memories and you know this better than I Maaz bin Jabal came running to the Prophet and he said Ya Rasulullah there is a young man at your door door of your mosque he weeps and laments but refuses to enter admit him into my presence said the Prophet they brought him he lamented said Ya Rasulullah O Messenger I have sinned to an extent that God will never forgive me he said, God will forgive you for he is most forgiving. He said, no, O messenger, God cannot forgive. God will not forgive this sin. He said, the prophet said, O young man, is your sin greater than all the trees on the face of the earth? The man said, yes. The prophet was disturbed by this. He said, is your sin greater than all the grains of dust upon the face of this earth? He said, oh yes, O messenger. The Prophet said, look towards the skies. Is your sin greater than the stars that adorn the sky? He said, yes, yes, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet was disturbed at this. His color changed. He said, how audacious you are, O young man. How audacious that you say your sin is greater than all of this. He said, Ya Rasulullah, listen to my sin. The Prophet did not prompt the sin, but he spoke. He said, I am one who snatches the shrouds of dead bodies. Last night, a young woman was buried. I snatched her shroud. I saw her. Shaitan overpowered me. I left her in an indignified state. I transgressed upon her body. As I was leaving, she spoke. May God deprive you of every dignity on the day of Qiyamah. The Prophet trembled and he turned his face and he was silent the young man went away after a few days Gabriel comes to the Prophet he said oh Muhammad Allah sends this verse and those people who commit great crimes and oppress their souls then seek forgiveness of Allah and do not persist in their crimes indeed Allah is most forgiving for them are paradise for them is paradise with rivers flowing beneath them. The Prophet was overjoyed. He said, Gabriel, what occasion such a revelation? A friend of God, O Muhammad. Who be the friend of God? Gabriel, deliver it to him. He said, Muhammad, I shall take you by the hand. God says, you will deliver this message. The Prophet says, lead me to him. Jibrail leads the Prophet to a place. And he says, look on. The young man was lamenting. He was saying, Oh Allah, either punish me in this world or forgive me. And if you forgive me, then send your messenger to me with the glad tidings of forgiveness. The Prophet ran to that man. He said, Oh young man, oh friend of God, God forgives you your sin and delivers this verse. This is how the Islam of Prophet was very tolerant, very human, 
very God-centric, very gradual. The prophet reserved the threat of punishment for the lowest of the law. He said, the most dignified of you need not be frightened of hell. And I will not belittle you by frightening you from hell. Your dignity, your sense of righteousness, your godliness is enough to carry you towards God. And this is why we find the great ulama of ours. And we read this in our fiqh books. That when they would be summoned. Sorry, the ulama write that those great men of God. When they would be summoned into court. And when they would have a case to make. When they would be the people who would lodge the case against a plaintiff. They would be asked. Take an oath by the name of Allah. And they would tremble. And they would say, no, we will not utter the name of Allah in vain. This worldly possession means nothing to us. Let it be taken away, but we will not use the name of Allah in this way. And it is said to the judge in the fatawa that if you see that this man is hesitating from taking an oath in the name of Allah due to the way Allah overpowers his heart, then don't force this man, but adjudicate in a different way. The Prophet's Islam was a gradual introduction he sets up this beautiful theology in when people become god centric and he says to them acquire those beautiful morals and morality that is the thing that will carry you forward and the law system was minimalistic which he said and we were going to inshallah talk about it further which can be changed and it is not sacred there is no sacredness about the law system of the Quran I will say this so now when in the lectures that are to come when we say cut the hands off the thief is no longer valid don't tell me it's inside the Quran for the Quran had pragmatic value and was limited contextually they had no other means of protecting the society from theft save by cutting off hands the value was protection of society the value was to make people God fearing so that they would not steal the cutting of the hand was the minimal expression that they could give at that point this is how beautifully the Prophet introduces his Islam now I ask this if in our madrasa system if in our communities if we had this sort of an attitude of tolerance if with our children we had this attitude of tolerance that gradually and slowly bring them of age imagine what sort of a community we could produce a community of God centric people who are not judgmental but who can look at each other and want the best in each other and from each other you saw the story and you've heard the story of Hussein Ibn Ali how beautifully he displays this example and the stories of his forefathers when Hur comes to Imam Hussein repenting Imam Hussein did not tell him go away you have sinned you have brought me into this hellhole Imam Hussein just does one thing he embraces Hur and he says my God has forgiven you when we ask Hussein why didn't you taunt him do you know what Hussein says it does not be befit a dignified man to belittle a dignified man if we ask Hussein but he is a sinner why don't you hold a grudge in your heart do you know what the response is the response is the sinner was the one who was there yesterday this is a new man altogether he has no sin upon his soul this is what the Islam of the Prophet taught us. I will take uh, questions if there are any now. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, okay, so in the context of minimalistic conditions of Islam as way of life, don't you value the recent scholarly works such as uh, Iqtisadul Islami, Al Bank Al Ra Rabawi, Islamic political system, Falsafatuna. Of course I do. The one thing that I don't value is 
When a scholar says this is Islamic economics or Islamic politics or Islamic philosophy or Islamic banking system, I will ask them what makes it so Islamic. That is my problem with them. If you say that yes, I have based this on the principles of Islam, then I will say that anything else that is based on the principles of fair play is also an Islamic system. So the capitalist system to a great part is Islamic. Yes? This is my problem. That when you call it Islamic, on what basis do you call it Islamic? When you say our philosophy, if you look into the metaphysics of our philosophy of Bakr al-Sadr, may Allah bless his soul, it is all Aristotelian. Why is it our philosophy? It is from the Greek masters. If you look at the Muslim philosophy, you will not be able to discern between the Greek philosophy and the contributions of the Muslims. And in the contributions of the Muslims, you will not be able to distinguish between the Sunni and the Shia contributors. And in Sadrian philosophy, you will not be able to distinguish between the contributions that are got from the Mu'tazila theology, the Ashaira theology, the peripatetic philosophy of uh, Ibn Sina, the Illuminationist philosophy of Surawardi, and Ibn Arabi's mystical insights. They are all amalgamated into one. How can that be called Islamic philosophy? It is human philosophy. The other problem is that whenever a book is titled Our Politics, it acquires a status of sanctity and sacredness, that this is Islamic politics. There is nothing Islamic about it, apart from the mind of a person who is contributing it. So there is no finality to it. So provided the readers understand that this is not sacred, it can be challenged, and by tomorrow it will become redundant and be confined to the archives of history, then it's Islamic, I don't mind. But if it means Islamic in the sense of eternity, and this is what Islam says, then I have a huge problem with it because it's not Islamic at all in that sense. Please explain the hadith that the Ummah Imam, uh, that the Ummah will be divided into 72 sects and only one will go into uh, heaven. Tell me something, have you, ever, have you ever counted the sects within Islam? Has anybody counted them? Please, there are over hundreds of sects. Tell me, where do 72 sects come from? First and foremost, go and count how many sects there have been in Islam. Yes? There are far, far more than 72. That's the first thing. Point number two. The Prophet gives paradise to the Christians and the Jews in the Quran. And then says, my ummah will be in 72 sects and one of them will go to heaven and 71 will go to hell and the Christians and Jews will go into heaven. Does that make sense to any one of you? Seriously? Then three, the Prophet says, in a language, the Prophet uses a language and we need to understand that language in its own context. Imam Hussein grabs, sorry, when Hur grabs the reins of Imam Hussein's horse, Imam Hussein says what? Sakulatka ummuk. May your mother weep at your death. He cursed Hur. He imprecated Hur, didn't he? Yes or no? From what you have heard, nod your heads. What happened? Imam Hussein's dua was not Kabul, was it? Hur became the greatest shaheed. Does that mean Imam Hussein's dua was refused altogether? Think about it. Or does it mean that we don't understand his language? That was the language of the day. May your mother weep on you. It doesn't mean that I'm cursing you to death and I'm cursing you to the pits of hell. It just means it's a way of using a language. So the Prophet just uses a language that it will be 72 sects, 71 of them will be in error to one extent or another one and one of them will be in more guidance than the other. Then I ask you, which of the 72 is more guided than the other one? Will you say the Shia? Then in that Shia you will definitely exclude me, won't you? So within the 72, you will have subdivisions of 72. And within those subdivisions, you will have one. And it's human condition to elaborate further, to have further interpretations. So within those 72 as well, you will have further division. Until only one person from Adam till Qiyamah enters into paradise. According to this hadith and its strict analysis, in the Ummah of Rasulullah, only one person will enter into heaven. And it will be a very lonely place. So such hadiths are not to be taken at face value.
they are supposed to be interpreted properly first and foremost it's not proper hadith doesn't make any sense but even if it is proper the prophet meant something else so the prophet says 73 people will go from karachi to islamabad 72 of them will be in error one of them will reach what does that mean eventually all 73 will reach there but one of them will go on to the straight road maybe maybe that's what it means and if that is what it means then it means that one group is scattered amongst the 72 groups amongst the 72 groups there are individuals who are sincere who surrender to allah whether as sunni whether as shia whether as ismaili whether as bora barelvi or diobandi that one group is scattered within the 72 groups that's the best of my understanding you are the forum is you have to write it down here and then, sorry the order is that but i will take it at the end okay please talk about bidah and bidah hasana and he's talking about salatul taraweeh now all this salat wajib is prayed with jama'ah except idain okay the quran uses the word bidah yes and it says that these christians they innovated a lot of their practices like the monks and the monasteries allah says we did not command them to do that at the same time allah praises them allah says this is bidah but he praises them and says they did it for my sake and therefore he praises them for their bidah so what is the bidah that is frowned upon in islam the bidah that is frowned upon are those cultures in the name of religion that are stifling the human growth i have discussed this in the la lectures that the only bidah that is condemned are those traditions in the name of god which are practiced religiously that then stifle the growth of the community that is frowned upon and if we can uphold that yardstick then we can gauge anything against that yardstick whatever we are doing whatever cultures we have apart from the minimalistic ones that the prophet has commanded us everything else can be discerned through it so tarawi if it is something done for the sake of allah if it is producing and if it's not stifling then it does not fall under that bidah and if it fell under that bidah then ali ibn abi talib alayhi, would not have been a person who would appoint the imam for them to pray tarawi as we said yesterday when the people asked imam ali lead us in tarawi he said the prophet didn't do this so i will not do it but then he sent his representative to lead them in their prayers Imam Ali would have said, no, this is wrong, don't do it, absolutely, he didn't do it. He didn't say that, yes? So it says you have been talking about the tolerance that the prophet practiced and the inclusivity and i'm not talking about the inclusivity i'll talk about it afterwards the plurality the pluralistic understanding that the prophet had but in today's islam in pakistan we have this notion of intolerance and exclusivity how do we reconcile what you are saying with what we see in pakistan it is not a problem with pakistan it's a problem with the 1.7 billion muslims we have become extremely arrogant stagnant regressive we are not understanding the human message of the quran the way to resolve this is to say to the muslim community revert to your godly intuition first step out of islam first and ask yourselves if i were to follow a god would i follow a god who is intolerant would i follow a god who does not value the good of other would i follow a god who condemns good people to the pit of hell your intuition and your inner godliness will say no as soon as that say no that says no then no that islamic teachings that we are being taught are all wrong and if there was any such thing in history it was in a historical context as we will explain afterwards
This is a question on taklid. Believe me, I can tell you God is not the way you understand Him. But if I tell you taklid is not the way you understand Him, you're going to stone me to that. Taklid is not the way you understand it, you'll stone me to that, yes? So I'll just say it in a very mellow way. That taklid is a rational principle. Taklid means making reference to one who knows something about something that you don't know. So for example, it's a human condition, it's a rational principle. If I have a fever and it's not going away, I will refer to a physician who knows something about that condition. I will take their opinion and might decide to take the course of medicines that they prescribe. This is known as taklid. No more, no less. As for namaz not being accepted without taklid, there is a huge rational argument for this that the ulama set up. I do not believe in that argument at all. The acceptance of namaz is not contingent on doing taklid of anybody. It is a spiritual act. The, ex the acceptance of the namaz is contingent, as Ali ibn Abi Talib says, on the refinement of the soul. Imam Ali recited the verse of the Quran. He said, if you become a better person after your salah, that salah has been accepted. You can be doing taklid of a thousand people. If you come out of your prayer as a get bigger monster, that prayer has not been accepted. If you don't do any taklid, you pray and you become a better person, that prayer has been accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is the job of the ulama to explain to us the proper method of ruku and sujood and tawaf and whatever else. Yes? So we venerate our ulama. We commend them to Allah for the trouble that they are taking. But the acceptance of amal is not contingent on putting anybody between us and God. Yes? And if anybody wants the full technical argument, then we can go through it afterwards. We do tawafun nisa at the end of our um, hajj. The Sunnis don't do it. Is there invalid or not? No. We have a fiqhi law. Everybody has a fiqhi rule. The Prophet of Islam used to say, لِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ nikah." Every people have nikah. So if when people in a country go and register their marriage, that is nikah for them. This is the principle that the four Imams of the Char four Madahib uphold and our uh, ulama also uphold. So it's Madahib al-Khamsa. All five madahib uphold this principle that if a person acts in accordance with their own school of thought, then their actions are valid. Yes? Okay, the first thing is at least the, those monsters had the Prophet to change them. Who does ISIS have? ISIS has their intuition. Yes, their minds. They should be referring and reverting to their intuition. That is their hidden Prophet. The Prophet of Islam said, I am the outer Prophet who has come to awaken the inner Prophet. The real Prophet is the one that's inside you. Yes? Can you give example of the barbaric immoral people that the Prophet changed into the best of people? Yes. There were people who buried six daughters who were butchers. And of course, I can't uh, pass the names because I don't know. We'll need to read a bit further into their names. And these people were the very Sahabis who became very sacrificing and very, very soft-hearted people. Quran speaks um, of Muslim all over the book. That Muslim is the real Muslim. It's not this organized faith of Islam. We can, we'll talk about it later on in the lectures. Quran has no humor. Allah says, I laugh at them. But it's not a book of jokes. Yes? But isn't it humorous that Hudhud is late and Suleiman stands there in his full glory. Where is Hudhud? I'm going to slaughter him. Isn't that humorous? This great Suleiman, who is the king of all kings, and Hudhud, according to the tafsir, is a little bird. And this little bird doesn't show up and Suleiman gets angry and says, where is he? If he doesn't have a good excuse, I'll cut his head off. I think that's quite humorous, to be honest.
did the Prophet teach a type of Islam that takes us beyond Sunni and Shia? Yes. Simply being a Muslim? Yes. That is the Islam he taught. What happened was that folding arms, opening arms, all these things were not seen as different sects. They were seen as variations in the interpretation of what the Prophet was doing. And they were a natural part of the human condition and human existence. They were never seen as different sects of Sunni and Shia. Sectarianism is a later development in Islam. And that's why from the sixth Imam till the seventh Imam, they were combating sectarianism within Islam. The sixth Imam's uh, recommendations and the eleventh Imam's recommendations are the same. Pray with each other. Visit each other. Uphold the trust with each other. Mingle with each other. Mix with each other. They were trying to stop this sectarian divide from the sixth Imam till the eleventh. So folding of the arms, opening of the arms were seen as personal interpretations of which the Prophet gave them liberty. The Prophet gave them liberty. He wasn't really concerned about folding arms and opening arms. He was concerned about godliness. He was concerned about greater things. He wasn't concerned about you call him Allah or Rahman or Rahim. Call him anything he would say, but call him. That was his concern. So these things did not amount to different readings of the same Islam, exclusivist readings. It was much after that these sects became exclusive readings of Islam. And this was the biggest problem ever encountered by Islam. Today we need an Islam, which we will talk about in the next few days, which is one Islam in which we can have plurality of interpretation. But that plurality of interpretation does not lead to sectarianism and stiff, uh, and sorry, strict readings of Islam. Um, sorry, now I'll take your question. Okay. Sorry. No. What Imam Sadiq? That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. What Imam Sadiq said was, I will give you the principles, and from these principles, you ramify. So, for example, if you look at what Imam Sadiq used to say, he used to say, Look, this is what the Prophet used to do, without saying what the others are doing is wrong. So the Imam Sadiq Salamullah would say, Alayna al qal usul wa alaykum an tufarri'u. My job is to give you principles, your job is to ramify. So he would say, this is the principle that the Prophet used to practice. Yes? That there is no causing of harm in Islam. And there is no damage and detriment in Islam. Now you derive your laws from this. The Imam Sadiq would say, that surety cannot be undermined by doubt. Now you go and ramify it as much as you want to. So in this way, the Imam Sadiq alayhi, gave the principles of Usulul Fiqh and gave the principles of Fiqh. Not the exclusivist readings. In fact, if we look at the contributions of Imam Sadiq, in fact, he was the very first one who actually began to reconcile. And inshallah, we need to talk about this at a later date. If that's all, then we will recite Surah Fatiha.